Hi, this is Chris Mosier from the Fan Film Podcast, and uh, we're finally in May 2009. Excellent. Summer is coming. So we are on uh, May 2nd, 2009. We are on episode 45. Enjoy. <laughs> Uh, you know, as Chris noted, we've seen our own film probably a hundred times for every one time that we've seen the original. And wow. When we, when we do see the original, um, you know, in addition to, you know, of course, the, the, the universal experience of being just utterly blissed out on, on, on the perfect adventure film, it's weird because, uh, you know, while it, first, let me say that, I mean, the original is the superior film, but it's like seeing a big budget remake of our film, if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen our film so many times. Uh, it's very surreal. <laughs> nice try, Lucas and Spielberg. Yeah. Keeping <laughs> off our, our remake, yeah. Should have shot, the, shot it in Betamax. It would have been much better. <laughs> yeah. I guess that authentic jungle feel down, you know, the rough and gritty filming. There you go. Exactly. The yeah. Who needs complete clarity? No. <laughs> <laughs> we want a couple of lines here and there going up and down. The authentic oh, yeah. Line. yeah, some bars of static and what have you. <laughs> yeah. Well, as for the charm, it really does. Like, like I see old fan films, and I'm like, that's so cool, you know? Because mm -hmm. yeah. that's authentic old school right there. Yeah, funny, that aesthetic, cool. I think, is something that a lot of people uh, enjoy now, the sort of... Mm -hmm. YouTube nation, you know, so we're both yeah. trying to engage, yeah. so. exactly. So you, you shot all the scenes to the film, um, you shot some of the scenes several times, and uh, then you put it away, you forgot about it, and uh, you went about your life. You, <laughs> Pretty you, much. You and Chris and Jason, and then, um, I mean, that's the, the shooting the film is only half the story. I know it was like seven-some years that you did that. Uh, but you put it on the shelf, you went your separate ways, and, and then um, it was revisited, obviously because uh, it's out there now big time. Um, why don't you talk about how, how it resurfaced? Yeah, so when we, uh, when we finally had our seven-year premiere in 1989, um, after seven years, I mean, something deserves a party that, you, you know, that takes that long. As he said, we went our separate ways and uh, off to college, respectively. I was a sophomore at NYU Film School by the time we finished. And, yeah, I sat on our bookshelves for uh, about 15 years, kind of collecting dust. And, um, you know, aside from occasionally uh, dusting it off and, and putting it, showing it in my col college uh, dorm TV lounge, uh, didn't really give it much thought and, uh, and went on to the corporate world. And about jump forward to 2003, and a copy that I had given uh, to an old college roommate of mine, well, he, he passed on a copy to a friend who liked it, made a copy, passed it on to a friend. Six degrees of separation later, a copy falls in the hands of Eli Roth, director of Cabin Fever, um, and later the hospital. hospital right? Yeah. So Cabin Fever is just picked up for distribution. So Eli is taking meetings around Hollywood, uh, including at DreamWorks, Spielberg's company. Cool. Yeah. So he and he's a uh, he loves our film, though he's never met us. Uh, oh, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So he, so he brings along a copy of this VHS bootleg tape of our film to his own pitch meeting and uh, slides it across the conference room table and said, guys, I had nothing to do with this, but you should really <laughs> check this out. 
and uh, you know, guy looks at the label Raiders Lost Ark. Um, I've seen it. You know, said, so, uh, no, you've not. <laughs> you haven't seen this. Yeah. And uh, so the head of production takes it home, watches it, and and loves it, and and calls Eli up and says, this is great. I'm going to give the tape to Stephen, mm-hmm. and uh, calls him back the next day. Stephen's got the tape. He's going to watch it this weekend. Calls Eli back on Monday. Stephen loved it. He wants to write the guys a letter of appreciation. What are their addresses? And wow. Eli, who doesn't know us from Adam, uh, of course, uh, doesn't know our addresses. But thank God, um, our names, of course, appear in the credits. And it's no longer 1989. It's now 2003. And there's that wonderful innovation known as the Internet, through which Eli tracks, manages to track one of us down, Jason, who in turn passes on Chris and I's contact info. And that is how uh, Chris and I individually got an email out of the blue um, one day. Uh, Hi, you don't know me. My name's Eli Roth. I'm a horror movie filmmaker. And this might sound strange, but Steven Spielberg has seen your Raiders movie, and he loves it. He wants to write you a letter of appreciation. And my first reaction was, all right, right. funny. Yeah, yeah, right. my leg. (laughs) Did you know know who Ellie Roth was? I mean, off the top of your head? Nope, no, right. no idea. And of course, he wasn't really Eli Roth uh, then. Right. Um, Captain Fever right. hadn't uh, hadn't really been released. So, um, but I wound up talking to Eli about three hours that night, and it dawned on me: Wow, this this is for real. And and uh, so, yeah, we gave Eli our addresses, and about a week later, each of us received uh, a very kind letter from Mr. Spielberg, thanking us for our very loving and detailed tribute. And I thought, wow, uh, my boyhood idol. I mean, it, wow, my head would have exploded, I think. Yeah. I look like Belloc after. <laughs> my wife actually took pictures of me uh, at various stages of opening the letter very slowly, you know, and, uh, and the stationery, you know, Stephen <laughs> and everything. It's just, uh, wow. Like, like Charlie great. from Willy Wonka. Yeah. You got your yeah, golden, I, golden ticket no, from your Wonka right. bar. I have the, 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 uh, the letter framed. Anyway, I thought, well, it, it can't get any better than this. Right. But, um, but it did, actually. We, uh, huh? That, in turn, led to us being invited down to the Alamo Draft House Theater in Austin, Texas. So it seemed Eli had passed on a tape to Harry Knowles of uh, Ain't It Cool News um, website. And uh, they, had, uh, they had screened a little bit of our film at uh, Buttonumathon the previous year, completely unbeknownst to Chris and Jason and I, that uh, there was a crowd of 300 people in Austin, Texas, cheering this film that they had no idea, you know, um, who made it or where it came from. Right. Um, and uh, so they invited us for a proper world premiere. And, uh, and so we went out to Austin, Texas, the three of us, and, uh, and had a big... Uh, our, our big premiere, and, and Jason wondered, huh, I, I wonder if anybody's going to show up. And <laughs> as the light went down in the packed out theater, I, I remember taking note of the exit doors in case I needed to pull, you know. Um, <laughs> but the Austinites just uh, just whooped and hooted and hollered and, and uh, gave it a stand, three minute standing ovation. And, and, uh, and uh, it was just un- unbelievable. And so that. Uh, was the beginning of us getting invited to, uh, to screen our film in various parts of the country. And we, we eventually decided to do so uh, under the stipulations that, it, you know, given the whole copyright thing, that uh, it always be for charity. Uh, no money goes in our pockets. We strive right. very, very uh, much to be respectful and non-exploitive. Uh, and uh, we don't advertise. People generally uh, kind of track us down. But as a result, we have screened uh, at over 70 different venues uh, across the world, um, from Chicago, uh, New York, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, Alaska, Australia, Germany. Later this month, we're actually having our London premiere, um, or or actually actually the UK premiere, um, at uh, Westchester Square, um, Tuesday, April 28th, for for anyone who happens to be in London. Um, Right. And uh, we had our L.A. premiere at Man's Chinese Theater. We've screened at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and, and even uh, a private employee screening at Skywalker Ranch. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah, we actually got to touch the original Ark of the Covenant prop. Um, so I've given up trying to bookend, uh, you know, uh, our, our story. Uh, it's, we don't know where, where it'll all go, but it's uh, it's uh, quite a, a wild, unexpected ride. No, no clue where that would No, be. absolutely no way. And, and you know, you, you couldn't have calculated uh, this type of thing. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, if you set out and say, you know what? 
20 years from now, we're going to make Mad Loop, you know, and, and, and it'll be a film, 10 film phenomena and, uh, you know, and, and people will really be into it. And maybe there'll be another indie film as well. Uh, you know, yeah, who knows, you know? Yeah. It's like, no, <laughs> you're high. <laughs> so, no, we just made it uh, because we love the film. And, and uh, I think had it been a calculated thing, uh, it would not have been embraced in the way that it has. Uh, I think people... Uh, you know, one, one, one person described their film as a, a love letter to the original, and uh, I like that a lot because uh, I think it does uh, sort of sum up uh, where we're coming from. They love to always shows in a, in a good fan film. Uh, yeah. It always comes across. Yeah. Till that uh, you, you'd be doing that shot for shot uh, remake of uh, the Temple of Doom, right? <laughs> for, well, yeah, I've well, never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good umpo. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a little flaming heart. <laughs> Actually, when we were screening in Newport Beach last year, and we met this 12-year-old kid who declared that uh, after after screening our film, he came up to him and said, "Okay, I'm inspired. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the torch, and I'm gonna make Indiana Jones: The Temple of Doom the adaptation." And uh, and we're like, cool, you know. And we actually uh, he did put together a teaser trailer, which I think you can. Um, can find on the internet um so don't know if if, if he uh will will carry it through but we're we're rooting for him yeah, oh i'd definitely love to see that yeah i'd have we'd have a trouble getting uh elephants and as i recall i remember we actually entertained the thought of doing a teaser trailer not really making it but just uh you know to follow the credits on ours mm -hmm. um but uh yeah between the the elephants and the mine car tunnels uh that's a challenging one yeah. um you actually had your story optioned or it's being optioned yeah. or yeah that, that's correct yeah we haven't talked about that yeah yeah one of the uh one of the uh bizarre twists to this uh you know after our, our big um austin screening led to uh harry knowles of uh internet film critic who uh writes for any cool news gave us an amazing review uh that night that in turn led overnight to this little fan film which hadn't even been so much as a rumor on the internet all of a sudden people are talking about in the netherlands and, uh, and and so we were approached by GQ, Rolling Stone. We finally decided to give an exclusive story to uh, Vanity Fair, which they wrote a 10,000-word article. That, in turn, led to uh, us being approached by Hollywood mega producer Scott Rudin, uh, who did films like No Country for Old Men and uh, wow. There Will Be Blood, yeah, um, wanting to make a, uh, a movie uh, of, our, of our childhood, uh, remaking Raiders. And... Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the bizarre twist is that there's going to be a, a major motion picture from Paramount Pictures of these whack, three wacky Mississippi kids uh -huh. who did a shot-for-shot -shot remake of Ray of Lost Ark in the 80s. Uh, so how bizarre is that? And, and That is and, awesome. <laughs> so if, uh, when it's released on DVD, if there's a making of featurette on the disc, um, I think it'll set a new record for a circular reference. Most definitely. Wow, that's, a, that's, that'd be a, that's off the wall. Have, that'd be a have you seen uh, Son of Rambo by any chance? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yes, uh, I have. Um, and uh, it's it's weird, uh, you know, because, yeah, that, that film has... Uh, uh, folks have drawn parallels to that, of course, you know, being about two kids who spend a summer doing a... Kind of a sequel, actually, more than a remake of... Uh, Using what they can, Rambo. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Little little whiffs of uh, familiarity. Of course, it's a it's a very British film. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah, Harry likened it to kind of like a uh, like a, an appetizer for the uh, the saga, the seven year saga of our uh, <laughs> of our story. So it's a it right. makes an interesting companion piece. It's the uh, the onion rings on the table there. Yes, yes, and then uh, and then the other film that's drawn recent comparisons is uh, Be Kind Rewind. Uh, Oh, okay. Not, right. Yeah, which I have not seen, but I guess the similarity is that they're they're uh, sweeting in that uh, movie, you know, which I guess is the country coined uh, term for remaking a film based on whatever is, is around you. So uh, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, it's weird that it seems to be all of a sudden cropping up, um, you know, in these multiple stories. Have you gotten any contact from any other uh, famous fan filmmakers at all? Or uh, You know, when we screened, uh, this isn't a, a famous fan filmmaker, but uh, when we screened in, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, actually, last year, uh, we were approached by a, a, a 70 or 80-something ge uh, year old gentleman who uh, apparently was also in uh, Homemade Hollywood, uh, the, the fan book by, uh, by Clive Young that uh, devotes a, a chapter to our story. He apparently had done a, uh, a shot, uh, no, a, a um, he had done a fan, Tarzan film right. back in the 30s, amazingly. I remember reading about that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So and and he uh, he was kind enough to bring us copies, and when we we traded uh, autographs, and uh, and uh, it was just really uh, <laughs> cool to see. You know, back when we did this in the '80s, before the the internet, you know, it felt like we're the only ones in the world doing it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of comforting in a way to know that we weren't alone. That there were also uh, other obsessive uh, geeky kids out there that were uh, you know make you know uh, drawn by the uh, by the passion for the story to kind of you know put it to camera so uh so it's cool um i think that's uh i think aside from uh hearing from some other folks who are doing other sort of contemporary indiana jones, jones fan films like uh treasure of the templars i think has been in production for a while yeah yeah that's it yeah still still in yeah is it yeah mm-hmm. yeah still working on it wow well i can at, at seven years to complete our films uh you know <laughs> Certainly or, understand. Uh, I've, I can certainly understand. If the finished product it looks great, you know, who cares how long it takes? It was yeah, worth the exactly. wait. Exactly. Yeah, some of the better ones take um, more time. Like the, the Tomb Raider, Tombs of the Tears of the Dragon. That took, oh, like, yeah, I remember, I remember following that for years. Yeah. Like, you know, first getting such a Valerie Perez, and then <laughs> is ready. Oh, it's almost ready. We're filming this part, this part, and this part. I'm like, oh, cool, <laughs> you know. That went on for, for years, so. Oh, I, I can totally relate. When I, you know, when I went to high school, I, what I would always hear is, "Hey, Eric, you finished that Raiders thing uh, this summer?" That's what she said last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, never this summer move. for real. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. When, uh, when I was, uh, you know, whenever I, you know, have a birthday party, you know, when you're young enough to actually believe that if you uh, made a wish and didn't tell anybody. That the wish would come true if you can if you can remember back to being kind of that young and that mindset. Uh, obviously, I mean, guess what my wish would be? You know, each year was uh, yeah. are we ever going to finish this damn thing? <laughs> and he got an extra. We got the uh, he the approval of Mister Mister Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm not complaining. Uh, some things are, are worth taking the extra time. Any thoughts on the uh, on the uh, last indie film, the new one? Uh it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's strange uh, to see. Um, there are gripes that I have with it, um, but the, among the positives are, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, if you're if you're a fan of the Rolling Stones, uh, say, and you got to see them in concert. Yeah, now they're you know they're kind of old and they're they're not as uh, as uh, energetic and uh, top of their game as they once were, but. But man, you got to see the stones, and uh, exactly, yeah. And it's I feel kind of that way seeing uh, seeing Harrison in the in the fedora and the leather jacket again. It's kind of like seeing an old friend, and uh, yeah, it is. It's cool, you know. So I tried to I tried to set aside my um, my adult cynicism and, and whatnot. There's uh, of course, you know, I, to enjoy it properly, you have to first come to terms. I think with that uh, there. I realize this now. There'll only be one Raiders, you know. No, um, definitely. Yeah. So with that, then I, I, I find that I can uh, I can enjoy it properly. Yeah. They're all their own animal, you know, Temple and yeah, Last Crusade and. It's kind of it's kind of like the Dark Knight now. You know, all superhero yeah. movies are going to be compared to it from here on out. So it's pretty mm, much exactly. same with the Raiders. Yeah. Like for for like Watchmen, right away they were, like, it had the darkness of the Dark Knight. Like right away they compared it. So wow. They didn't wait long. No, no, they didn't. I guess uh, the time frame, uh, you know, uh, for classic is uh, is shrinking. Did you guys ever have any desire to do any other fan films or any other, (laughs) maybe taking something else on? Uh, No, I mean, I think, suffice it to say, after seven years, uh, you know, having started when we were 12 and finished when we were 19 and a sophomore in college, you know, ready to uh, to um, move on to other things. In my right. case, you know, you quitter. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah, only oh, seven nope. years. <laughs> Give me a it break. Was, it was, uh, it was. You know, I could definitely recommend it as a uh, as a great learning experience. You know, to kind of trace the footsteps of the masters. You know, and uh, right. you know, kind of holds your feet to the fire in terms of, uh, you know, uh, more so than if if we'd begun a completely original thing. If we, uh, you know, it's like well. Uh, boulders could be kind of hard to make. Maybe we should just cut the thing out. Well, if you're remaking an existing film, well, everybody will know where the exactly. boulder scene. So, yeah, that uh, that forced us, I think, to. That's uh, probably what I admire it. most about your film is like most people today just go, "Oh, that's too hard. We're not going to do that." But you guys said, "Screw that!" You just went <laughs> in there and you did it. You made it happen. 
Exactly. You yeah. know, that's what I love most about your film. It's just incredible it's the stuff you guys pulled off. Thank you. You know, I, Thank I, I you. still can't believe it. And here we are, 2009, and I'm looking at this thing like, wow. <laughs> like, how the hell did they do that? And it's absolutely crazy. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you know, as Chris and I are, are, are now um, working on, uh, as, uh, you know, approaching 40 and are, are uh, actually have a new passion project I here, you know, <laughs> that we're getting off the ground. It's funny, you know, that this film that we made when we were kids actually uh, sort of still kind of teaches us lessons, you know. It's like, okay, uh, you know, when invariably, you know, you hit discouraging times, you hit tough times, you hit obstacles that seem uh, impossible. And it's like, okay, you know, we've done this before. <laughs> we've gone through the ordeal of, uh, you know, the uh, self-doubt and, and the, uh, and the uh, you know, the lack of support and, and whatnot. And, uh, and having actually been through that experience, you know that if you can fight through that uh, you know, and come out the other side, uh, you, uh, you actually do it. And uh, if you don't listen to the... Uh, the real or perceived uh, sense of limitations. So uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of a, a very surreal thing. I can imagine. Yeah. And and you're doing your own film, and what the what the river takes is um, your your own creation that you guys are trying to put together. I'm assuming you're still trying to put together. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, we've been uh, we've been working on um, uh, we've been working with a line producer, breaking down a budget, and uh, getting a business plan together. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, a lot of lot of work to be done. But uh, locations uh, in our home state of Mississippi are scouted. We've got uh, relationships in place with the uh, Mississippi Film Commission here, and uh, and uh, with our uh, agent and manager, um, we have uh, have some some inroads made, but still a ways to go. Yeah, I'd definitely be interesting to hear about when the partner gets back. Cool, cool. Yeah, should be back uh, soon. Huh? Yeah, Chris uh, should be able to tell you. Uh, a good bit about it, and yeah, actually, it does look to be about that time. I should probably run. Okay. Um, but, uh, guys, thanks. Uh, thanks for the interview. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah. Oh, my, my pleasure. Um, thanks, guys. <laughs> Take, Take care. care. So much, and you know, congratulations on such a great piece of work, and just that's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can think of. Just wow, good job. My guys. pleasure. Th thanks. Thanks. Fantastic. Have a good one, guys. Keep Take touch. care, pal. Bye bye. So, oh, Mr. Chris. Hello. Hey. Welcome back. Hey guys, hey. how's it going? He's back for more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more more abuse. More punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why did they call me back? You picked up your daughter, okay? I take it. Yeah, I picked her up fine. Okay, it's just, cool. uh, you know, she's obviously a priority. So I got to get her home and get her get her uh, tucked in and you know down for the afternoon just yeah. for a little nap. You know, she spins out otherwise. <laughs> well, I'll tell you where we left off. Um, we pretty much we talked about. Uh, Eric's experiences as far as uh, meeting Mr. Spielberg, and I thought we'd get your slant on that. And then um, what we were most interested to get into was um, the film you guys are working on, or the uh, the concept of the film, what the river takes. Well, meeting Spielberg, it was obviously a dream come true. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, it's too hard to even you know imagine that that would have ever happened. I mean, you know, we joked about it when we were kids, but you know, it's it's something that we you know, never in a million years would ever dream of, you know, of that happening. And he was very kind and gracious with his time. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's always a little dangerous meeting somebody that you kind of idolize. And, uh, you know, there's not many people that I do, but, but he's, he's certainly one. And the meeting with him was everything that I wanted it to be. You know, he was, you know, his, uh, warm and, and very, you know, very paternal and, you know, very, very gracious and very down to earth and, you know, and, uh, um, you know, was sort of intimidatingly focused on, you know, just like listening to us and, you know, and, and, uh, and, um, you know, gave us a really nice compliment and said, well, boys, you know, I took a movie home and I watched it and, and I watched it again and I wanted to let you know that it inspired even me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's so awesome. Yeah. And and you know that's a that's a chill bump moment. You know that's oh definitely one of, the, one of those things that imprints itself on you forever. And uh, and then later on, when Empire Magazine out of the UK did a huge spread on uh, Indiana Jones an anniversary issue, and did an interview with uh, with uh, Spielberg. At the end of the interview, he basically said, you know, to this day. Those 
three kids that went off into the Chopper Shot remake of Raiders is the single greatest bit of flattery that George and I have mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, because that was Spielberg and Lucas. I mean, Lucas used to yep. film himself yep. in his uh, parents' car mirror. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so having that sort of public endorsement and all private endorsement, just one on one, is is something that is is absolutely could be cherished. I mean, Spielberg is is not just another Hollywood filmmaker. He's he's changed the face of cinema absolutely. and changed you know people that are cinephiles for you know the rest of their life. It has sort of shaped. It shaped our, it shaped us completely, you know, and it, and it created our sort of cinematic DNA, to so to speak, you know. And uh, not everybody feels that way, but a lot of people do. And uh, and meeting him was was the cat's meow, you yeah. know. And it's definitely given us a lot of endorsement. And um, and it's been, it was, it was an amazing experience, amazing. And um, as far as the movie that Eric and I are working on, we've been chiseling away at it uh, for you know a few years now. Script is done. We've got some amazing concept art that we um, hired an artist out of Poland to uh, to do. Um, he just was a just a masterful artist. And uh, I've been putting together all the production and business materials to shop to investors and studios right now. And I've been shopping it. And you know, it's a hard road. It's a it's a hard task getting a movie financed and getting talent attached and all that kind of stuff. But we're not giving up. And we're following our dreams, and our, our our long-term sort of mission statement is that we want to plant down and inspire more production in our home state, you know, and and turn the Mississippi Gulf Coast into sort of our little Austin, you know, yeah. and Rodriguez and Link Litterton and stuff like that, and make it sort of our hub, you know, a filmmaking hub because it's a really special place, and Mississippi's got a lot to offer. So, uh, and it's, it's certainly certainly gone unnoticed. Uh, <laughs> in many, many regards, um, you know, and so we want to uh, help help change that, or at least start to change it. And um, so, you know, it's also great to be working with with my best friend, and again, and and uh, you know, I don't work with anybody else the way that I work with Eric. And uh, it's a great story, a great movie. Basically, it's a it's a father quest. It's a river adventure of a young boy. Uh, early on in his life, his father goes missing and is presumed dead. And he, many years later, it turns out that his father's actually uh, still alive. And and uh, so he um, uh, he ventures up the Mississippi River with uh, his childhood best friend, who's also a love interest, searching for his father, who is being held captive by a strange and mysterious river cult living deep in the Delta. We, our overall goal was to put everything in a movie that we we want to see in a movie right. and return to a lot of mm-hmm. old school filmmaking techniques and um, you know not a lot of CGI just good basic practical in camera filmmaking and good old mythological storytelling you know returning to that that classic Joseph Campbell hero cycle and that's 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 our first film out the door you know that's what we're working on right now. Hmm. Yeah, just like Very uh, cool. So you guys all still live in Mississippi, huh? What's that? You guys still live in the same area in Mississippi? Well, Eric does. Eric okay. is based down there. That's where our, that's where our, our production company is based, Rolling Boulder Films. It's in Ocean Springs. That's pretty much where we where we grew up. That's our that's our home base. And I'm in Los Angeles. I've been here for about 14 years. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. You would have been so, just a place to be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if it's yeah, if it's. it's uh, you know, uh, finance a movie at the place to be. <laughs> Let's put it this way: lots of different types of movies, and by different, I mean somewhat bizarre, <laughs> somewhat yeah. nude. Yes. Well, I think what, what is it? What's the statistic that eighty-five percent of the of America's porn comes from Van Nuys? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty whopping. Hey, it's out, it's warm there. Yeah. You can take your clothes now, off and Van feel Nuys comfortable. Is, is uh, you know, it's just far enough to be uh, far enough, far away enough to be far away. Everybody's ever had Indiana Jones porn. I'm sure they have. They, they, they porn is out of everything. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's funny. I was in the DVD business for a long time, and uh, there was this kid that came through that shot, a, shot an adult film, and we ended up, it was a company policy. We didn't do any adult material, but he came through, and he goes, well, it's not really porn. It's kind of soft core. And I was like, yeah, this, this is porn, man. And he, he did a spinoff on, uh, on Tomb Raider. He called it Womb Raider. <laughs> I really love the titles. Oh, it's great! Like that. Yeah, I was like, "Oh man, <laughs> people really, <laughs> really just yeah. Indiana Bone and yeah, exactly. Yeah, something to that nature." Hey, Chris, uh-huh. 
Whatever happened to the strike out there? I mean, uh, did the actors' contracts expire like almost a year ago and still no, no strike? No, as far as the SAG strike, that's been, you know, uh, I, I'm a SAG member myself. Yeah. I'm also a member of AFTRA, but, you know, I'm also an independent producer, so I'm sort of, you know, I do see both sides of the coin, of course. And, you know, if there's a, a faction of the entertainment industry that is being underserved or being pushed to the side or disrespected or not, you know, not not getting what they should, then, you know, I'm all about, you know, standing up, uh, you know, but it's it's such a it's such a political nightmare, it's such yeah. a political mess and with internal fighting and hierarchical, you know, uh, cattiness and, you know, public displays of, you know, political sort of bravado and, and memos and, you know, infighting and, you know, negotiations after negotiations. It's like, honestly, I, I turn it off after a while yeah, and all the yeah. updates I get from SAG and all the stuff I read in the trades. Honestly, you know, it's hard for me to pay attention anymore. You know, I'm just sort of tired of it. I'm like, you know, um, you guys need to figure it out. You know, I just figured out the stuff that's been going on for a long time. Come to an agreement figure it out. I mean, the writer's strike nearly, you know, shut this whole city down. And, is, is that, and, um, yeah. and so that's, that's a lot of leverage and a playing card that SAG does have, but a lot of people are going to be way pissed off if they strike. Yeah, so, so in an economy and after the writing writer strike, then they, you know, they kind of set off to, to do another strike for the actors then. I, that's what I'm seeing uh, outside yeah, of the you fact. Know, yeah, exactly. The, the, the actors are sort of, you know, the, the you know, SAG is, is trying to use the wake, I think, of the writers, yeah. of the writer strike, which was, you know, 20, 25 years in the making, you know, uh, uh, to set the tone for, well, we're going to do it. 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 We're gonna, we'll do it already then, you know. Yeah. Strike. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. You know, and so in this I, I get academy, I get yeah. tired of reading the trades every day. If yeah. I'm going to do it, and we're going to do it, and it's all you know. So. Yeah, I'm surprised but, it didn't happen last July, honestly. Yeah, you know, it's a close few weeks away. We're yeah. two weeks away from yeah. a strike. Yeah. You know, as far as the world of actors and the world of producing, uh, where I really sort of perked my ears up, the last interesting bit of news is that the economic downturn has sparked studios and production companies to be a lot more aggressive in terms of negotiating lower uh, salaries for actors and talent not being able to throw their weight around as much as they have been in the past. And I think that's, a, I think that's successful. You know, um, actors may not feel that way, you know, but trying to put a film together where 50 to 60 percent of your of your budget that you're going out to investors with is it goes to talent right you know, and it's, it's a it's a killer now with so much talent out there now um i mean not necessarily born and in, in bred in hollywood uh where an actor can take a reduced price and you're trying to make a um, industry in mississippi that's got to be attractive to you um, and that's got to really piss the union off. Is is that well, the case? The thing, is, is that now that technology is so much cheaper you know, and everything, and the, the union actually, you know, SAG, in all my, you know, uh, my relationship with them is is really, you know, it's it's still very very early yet because I'm not in a place where I can put money up front to retain, you know, after services and and put money towards their their pension and health care to you know, sort of agree to bring them on to a production. I'm not, I'm not at that point yet. Right. It's like, I mean, it's, it's the most difficult thing is like, you got to hire actors, you got to have money to hire actors, but you got to have actors to get the money, you know, for the investors like, well, who's attached? Who's agreed to do the movie? Who's on board? Well, nobody yet. Okay. Well, come back to us. You have some letters of intent and people have kind of signed on. They like the script. Okay. Well, then you go back to the actors and then you go back to the investors and then you go from the investors back to the actors. And, you know, it's like this back and forth, but my dealings with SAG and all the phone calls that I've made for, you know, re, you know, after and SAG and all the labor unions and certain in the region that I want to shoot in, which is Mississippi. And that, that office, it's like coastal Florida, Mississippi, pockets of Louisiana, southern Louisiana, Alabama, you know, um, have been all positive. You know, like they're, they want their people to work. So if you have a production that's honestly going forward and it's legit and you're 
bothering contacting them and paying attention to actually going through steps to properly adhere to contractual agreements and paying people the way they should be paid, SAG is great. You know, they're really, they're really uh, extremely helpful, you know, very, very helpful. Um, check back with me in a year, I might feel otherwise, but, you know, um, but right now it's all been positive. And the other thing is, is Mississippi is a right to work state. So, you know, um, so I have flexibility there. You know, obviously it's it's ideal to hire pros and union people, but I have the flexibility to, you know, within a certain percentage of my, my production staff to hire people that aren't union. Yeah, I wonder if you really need the, the, the big name actors anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm certain, sure in certain cases you do, um, but with a lot of uh, Hollywood actors turning to even television now, um, which used to be beneath them, I'm wondering if you really need that top name anymore. Um, in the industry, and you tell me differently because I'm just some schmo that goes to work every day, but when I go watch a movie or, or TV, I don't really necessarily care about who's going to be in it, but more the concept. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, and that's coming from a place of, uh, you know, I understand I'm the same way, you know, obviously a recognizable face helps, you know, you're, you're, you're probably, you know, and... You know, there's a lot of people out there that are a little more savvy in regards to the film world, and they see stuff that's fresh off of the film festival circuit that may not have names, that has some very talented actors. But those kind of movies, you know, fall through the cracks, fall through the cracks by the hundreds. Yeah. You know, and there's only the rare gem of a film that comes out of a festival circuit with no name actors where people go, oh, my God, you have to see this film. It is absolutely brilliant. Okay, well, who's in it? You know, I mean, that that's the first question that most people are going to ask. Yeah. But here's the thing, is that in order to put the financing packages together, investors and, and, and film reps and people that are, are, uh, are, you know, buying and selling distribution territories in advance to get those monies, they want to know, Who's going to be put on the front of the cover? With the DVD cover, they want to know who's on the poster. You know, it doesn't really matter. They may be, there's tons of great actors out here, but you have to have some recognizable faces to push a film through the pipeline and get it made, you know, and it's, it's difficult. And so, you know, the business end of it is that. The artistic side of it is that, well, just give me a good movie that's really entertaining that I can watch. And as far as actors doing more TV, well, in my opinion, I think TV... And the stuff that's coming out of like HBO and Showtime and stuff like that is like set the bar, you know. It's yeah, like absolutely. the bar in terms of programming quality. I mean, the the, the, the quality of TV this, these days is like amazing, you know. I mean, it's like I don't I'm not an avid TV watcher. I don't watch a lot of TV. In fact, I don't even have cable. I've got like you know four channels that barely come in, you know, <laughs> uh, and the rest is static. I, I'm a Netflix guy, and I get everything else else off the internet, but. Look at you know. Look at Deadwood. Look at The Sopranos. Look at Six Absolutely. Feet Under. Look at Lost. Yeah, look I'm, at, that's know. something I'm no, just I into mean, now, and that's actors I had no idea who the hell these people are, and like yeah. now they're just awesome to me. So anything that yeah, they're in, I I'm going to watch. But I, you know, I'm lost. I'm there every week, yeah. and I'm such a, I'm such a, I geek out to that show <laughs> so hard. And in turn, how, how has um, your Raiders of the Lost Ark the adaption? How has that, if anything, opened any doors for you? Well, I think I, I think it, you know, in terms of meet, getting meetings and getting a certain level of notoriety and people knowing who we are. I mean, when you when you get a full spread in Vanity Fair and you do the festival circuit and meet with Spielberg and Lucas and and Scott Rudin's making a movie about you, inevitably people are going to pay attention because people in the industry want to want to perk up their ears, you know. Not because they're truly interested in you, because they want to know, wait a right. minute, what, what is this guy doing? You know, and how can I, you know, what what happened here? Yeah. I mean, how do you shoot a remake of a film that's already been made when you're 11 years old and, you know, pull a meeting with Rudin and Spielberg? You know, how do you, how do, you do that? You know, so I think that a lot of industry people <sighs> meet with us because they're interested to see who we are and, you know, so we've got our foot in the door, but getting fully in the door is another story. You still have to go in and pitch your wares and, and, and show them that you have a project worth buying, you know, but, and, and a movie worth making. So, you know, I mean, Clint Eastwood still has to pitch his films. 
<laughs> the poor guy's yeah, almost you know, 90. True. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how long has that guy been making movies? You know? He's and, great. Uh, you know, you still find yourself in an office across a desk from somebody who has the key to the castle, you know. A lot of that structure is changing. A lot of the economic structure is changing. And studios and production companies, independent producers that have first-look deals and stuff like that, you know, uh, credit lines are changing. Private equity is changing. Hedge funds and all that kind of stuff is shifting. And Technology is and totally changing. The, the cheapness so, of making product. Selective. Yeah, and so people are a lot more selective about what they're putting the money into, yeah. which is going to, in effect, uh, result in a lot less product out there. You know, I, I, I think probably in the next few years, Hollywood's going to make 50% less, uh, fewer movies than they do now, only because marketing budgets are so high and, you know, actors' salaries are still challenging and yeah. production... Yeah. You know, union fees are still, you know, challenging. And, you know, the next, you know, a low-budget indie movie, you know, the next thing you know is costing you $60 million. <laughs> you know? All right. So. There'll be more of those uh, slumdog millionaires coming out there. Yeah, yeah, you know. And so, yes, it's open doors, but you still have to go in there and do the song and dance. Yeah. But it's nice to know that people know who we are. You know, it's nice to know that in many cases I can get phone calls returned in most cases, you know, <laughs> not in all cases, but, you know, it's still, it's still getting, getting in there and, and, and running with the dogs, you know. Well, that's the thing, because, because you made this uh, fan film, uh, Fanboy Will and I, I'll speak for you, Fanboy Will, um, okay. I, we know about you guys, we want to see what you're going to do next. Um, yeah, exactly. okay. It was uh, 20 some exactly. years ago you, you did this film, but you get so so much notoriety, especially in in fanboy will and in myself's community, where we you know we're comic book geeks for fanboys and whatnot. But we know about Raider, we love Raider, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, we love what you did in adapting it. So we we want to see what you're going to do next. So I think that's. And um, I can't tell you how much that support means. It really it has given the fuel to our little machine, you know, here of pushing our readers around the world and also trying to convince people that we are bankable enough to, uh, you know, invest in to make another a movie and another one after that. And so, you know, that kind of energy and that sort of attention um, is extremely valuable to us. You know, and that's one of our points, actually, that we even talk about in our business plan that we're shopping around, you know, which is, you know, we have an amazing army of people around the world who are part of the fan community who are, who love genre cinema, you know, um, who are horror fans and sci-fi fans and, you know, they read comic books and they see adventure movies and they love fantasy and role-playing and, you know, they go to conventions and, you know, all the way through the line to families and, you know, dads who are Raiders fans and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's this, there's this energy of people, you know, this energy from people out there that are like, okay, guys, we're totally behind you. What are you going to do next? You know? <laughs> and that is, that's extremely exciting for us because that really, that's the support that you fall back on when, you know, producer, a, you know, doesn't call you back or reschedules a meeting or turns you down or sends your script back or whatever, you know, it's like, okay, you know what? We can do this. We can totally do this. Yep. We got your back. <laughs> we do. We, we honestly it's, do. It's very, it's very supportive. It's a very, you know, I found the fan community and, um, you know, all the people who are part of everything that I just mentioned to be extremely loyal. Uh, in regards to what they like, um, and very vocal, you know, it's a very dedicated and vocal and smart, um, active community of people around the world that, you know, if they like something, man, they're going to talk about it. Or if they don't like something, they're going to talk about it. And, and that's, and that's so great because it shows a passion for film and comic books and, you know, gaming and, you know, the world of, the world of fantasy and sci-fi and genre and, you know, escape <laughs> and entertainment. You know, it's great. Anything from the daily doldrums. Yeah. The humdrum. You just, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Chris. What do you got, fanboy? Do you have anything further? No, or? I think I've monopolized the end of the conversation. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fresh out of questions at the moment. Cool, guys. Well, you know, uh, it was interesting hearing about your, your, your new project. Yeah. Uh, would you like to give maybe any plug? Well, you know, I mean... 
The plug is, uh, you know, they, we've got a great write-up on Vanity Fair about our new project. Not only addition, you know, we've got our write-up on Vanity Fair about our Raiders movie, but uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Hogan did an article uh, about a year ago uh, talking about our movie, What the River Takes. So you can log on to Vanity Fair Daily and yep. do a search for our movie. I'm what on it right now. Read the article. Yeah. And I'm checking out the image. Start and, um, you know, get a gist of, of the plot summary and what we're doing. Yeah. It was great talking to you, man. It's really, really a pleasure. Uh, uh, yeah, it was Excellent. it was good to talk to you guys too, and thanks for your good thanks. questions and uh, and the flexibility. I know it was a little staggered, so uh, oh, right. I appreciate you work, That's working fine. with me on that. So, uh, all right, sir. All right, guys, we'll have a great week. Have and, a good uh, evening. In touch. Absolutely. Thanks much for having us, buddy. Take all care. All right, man. Bye bye now. Bye bye.